happens in the cups. It looked like a pura from my point of view. Yep, yep. There What's you your go. favorite tea? Ooh, that's tough. I love herbal and green teas. So okay. I like a lot of South American herbal teas. Oh, like yerba mate. Mm -hmm. oh. Yerba mate is amazing and uh -huh. plays a really key role in South American culture, obviously. But yeah. there are also some other really cool herbal teas. Um, the acai berry oh, okay. uh, was found in, in northern Brazil, and they have some really cool kind of herbal acai teas. Um, and then I like a lot of green teas from, from China. Mm. Um, Dragonwell, I think, is one. Yeah, Dragonwell is um, very well known. And then I also like white teas, which are green teas, right? They're 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 the way of processing it is very similar to green tea. Gotcha. Um, but there's a little bit distinguished from the green tea. Gotcha. Yeah, I like white tea. As well. Yeah, I really. I just got. I just had my first white tea over the summer and loved it. There's this one I had. I think it's called Anji. Anji white tea. Anji, yeah. 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 It's good stuff. Yeah. That's very exciting. How about you? What's your favorite tea? Puar. You guys? Um, I would say the Puar as well. Yeah, like, we've, we've been having tea with uh, Will for, like, just in our dorm room. Gotcha. And we've, we've been having, like, a lot of Puar just because of that. That's, like, that, yeah. that's like right this right larger supply I have yeah. here. That's my favorite. <laughs> so naturally. Is your, um, it looked like it was fermented a little bit. Do you know... Do you know kind of what the process was? Yeah, this so tea? all pours are naturally fermented, and you, so you know how the pour you have to ripe and show. Mm -hmm. Wait, well, that's the same thing. Ripe and show is the same thing, and you have shin or raw. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So the shin or the raw type is like it's naturally fermented, and then the ripe or the show is um is from is like aged and like ripened. Um, like you actually add bacteria to speed up the fermentation process mm -hmm. so it's a lot more earthy and dark and they're all they're both overall really great but the the shin is a lot more i feel like it's a lot more potent in terms of like the feeling and the yeah i'm excited for it i'm yeah. excited for it i so i like um astringent teas like obviously if i'm, I'm drinking yerba i'm getting something that's bitter yeah. kind of puckery yeah. so typically the less fermentation better which i think usually is the opposite way around for more people but i'm i'm excited i'm really excited to see yeah, so what you got. this one is actually the raw so it's not oh very cool yeah, yeah very cool it's not the earthy it's still pretty it's more stringent than the uh show mm -hmm. in my opinion but it's um i like it a lot awesome yeah <laughs> What made you get into tea? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, this was one of the stories I wanted to talk about, but it was it was really training with the Argentinian national team. So right. I uh, played for the Earthquakes um, in the MLS during my academy years, and yeah. it was 2016. The Copa Americas were in San Jose, yeah. um, and our technical director called me and said, hey, man, uh, Argentina needs a backup goalkeeper. They need a goalkeeper just to train and prepare them for their game against uh, Chile. Wow. And I was oh, wow. absolutely shell-shocked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was insane. <laughs> and I spent the better half of a week um, training with the, the Argentinian national team with like the likes of Messi, Aguero, wow. all the big names. And one thing I noticed is they had their bombillas. They had their yeah. Yeah. teacups with them every day when they came to training. Yeah. And I had no idea what yerba mate was at the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, so, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we see pictures of Messi with like a, a mate. Yeah. Oh, it, it's yeah. just it's it's a, it's a part of their culture and it's every day. It's like a routine, yeah. um, and that kind of sparked my interest. I would say in tea and so that brought you. That's what got you into the tea world. Yeah, yeah, and I would say I, this summer I got a little more into tea. Nice. Yeah, as well. Sorry. How about you guys? I'm gonna let you talk so I can drink the tea. Okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, I got into tea over. Corona, um, cause like my family just like my mom especially just got into tea recently, like the past few years. Mm -hmm. And over the Corona, like I was at home alone with my brother, and then so like I had like this whole tea set by myself, and I started brewing tea every day. And also that was partly sparked from the interest of going back to China this past year. Mm -hmm. I'm like this thing is like so cool, um, cause I started drinking, I started visiting tea shops and drinking tea with my mom and her friends and like wow this is a whole process and ritual behind it after I got more into it and started talking to other people 
who kind of dedicate their life to tea. I'm like, wow, this is like, there's something really meaningful behind this. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, basically what got me into it is that the whole like aspect of making you more mindful and grounding. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And then? Well, uh, I like, I lived in England for a while, so like I kind of, you know, tea is kind of like a big thing there, like a tea time, but it was only like, (laughs) like fake tea. (laughs) as yeah. Will likes to refer to it but uh, Br- Britain really went and <laughs> stole China's tea and made it worse yeah. so props to you no I'm just kidding yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, William sent me um, like a tea kit over the summer oh cool like just like a starter kind of thing yeah and I was brewing it a lot over the summer and it was just awesome so he, yeah. I, I kind of got into real tea because of Will yeah very cool yeah it was, it was awesome Absolutely. And then um, I've gotten into tea very, very recently. Like, since we've moved in, um, I got to drink tea with Will for the first time. I guess I kind of got into it over the summer, uh, just kind of following Will's Instagram. I would text him about it and be like, yo, I cannot wait to drink tea with him. And he's the hype beast of tea. Yeah. Exactly. He literally hyped it up. Yeah, but one thing I do want to clarify with tea is that, like, I'm like my tea might be a bit biased because it's specific to Chinese tea. Yeah. But I also drink yerba mate because one of my best friends at home is um, from Paraguay and he mm-hmm. actually um, like made, made a custom set of like yerba mate. So, like it's so sick. But but yeah. So when I refer to it as real tea, I just mean like <laughs> I'm not talking like this is like this is obviously real tea, but not because it's like the Chinese tea ceremony. More because the tea that we're drinking is the. It's a whole leaf from the plant Camellia yeah. sinensis, and that's different from like tea bags because oh, yeah. those are like loose leaf is yeah, yeah. yeah. if yeah. you're not having loose leaf that's, yeah what do you like mean? loose leaf that's the word yeah um, so yeah should we go ahead and introduce the tea yeah so the tea we're drinking as mentioned briefly earlier is the this is um. Cha, which is, as you've seen previously, it was like, you know, a compressed ball, mm-hmm. and now it's, uh, now it's kind of opened up, expanded, but Torcha is, is it, that's just a form, um, but the tea we're actually drinking is a uh, Shin or Raw Puar from, I think, um, it's, it's relatively young, and when I say relatively young, it's like two, three years, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, but this tea is a, uh, what makes what makes the the Steve special is that it's the big leaf varietal and it has to be specifically uh, harvested from Yunnan, Southwest China. So that's a little bit briefing about the tea. Awesome. Yeah, and I don't think we introduced yeah, our guest, yeah. our guest <laughs> Dominic, Dominic to the show. Welcome Dominic to the tea show, to tea together. So Dominic is the senior, a senior at Wake Forest. He's also the men's soccer team goalie. Dominic has previously trained with Argentina national team and also played with San Jose um, Earthquakes. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Delighted to be here and thanks for having me. Thank uh, you. It's a nice day today and drinking tea with friends. You can't get much better than that. No. Under a tent. <laughs> Under a tent. It's the best. Socially distanced. Socially distanced. Following all the rules. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that's... Um, I think what we want to start talking about is you're a senior now, right? So yep. you've been at Wake for quite some time, and I would probably we can agree that you've gone through the pretty much the entire full experience of being a student athlete mm-hmm. in college. So would you be able to share some of your experiences and also perhaps some challenges and ups and downs? Yeah, I mean that's that's what life is is ups and downs, but. Um, Speaking from specifically a student athlete lens, um, I would say life gets a little bit more complicated. Obviously, uh, regular students have all the challenges in the world, um, but I think being a student athlete is unique in the in the fact that you have to balance so many things. Right. Um, I see myself more than just a student and an athlete, and I mean doing things like this is so important to me, even as a senior. Um, but it, it certainly took some adjustment. Um, I came into college and uh, obviously I'm playing at a really competitive program and in that in order for that program to be competitive they have to ask a lot out of their players um, and 
as much as I wanted to give all I had to soccer, I wanted to give all I had to school and yeah. to climbing and to hiking and yeah. to tea. So yeah. um, that certainly posed a challenge because you had to find this unique balance yeah. between soccer, between school, yeah. and what other, what other priorities you had. Um, and I still, I'm still challenged by that. Um, as I just mentioned, I got off a team call about five minutes ago and raced over here. So I appreciate you guys being patient, but um, everything comes with a price and everything comes with a sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think those are the lessons I've taken away from this. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, what do you think are like the, like between like normal students and student athletes, like is it, do you think there's kind of a divide between them? Or? Yeah, it, there's definitely a divide, and it's something that's unfortunate and something that um, I'm really focusing a lot of time on <laughs> this year. Um, I'm the vice president of what we call SAC. It's called Student Athletes Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we've noticed, and I think it's a divide that um, has existed for a while mm -hmm. and has existed for many reasons. Um, I think some athletes are to blame, um, thank you, for not wanting to kind of go outside their circle, yeah. go outside their bubble. Yeah. And I think a lot of students, I don't know what you guys see, but you might see the same thing. Yeah. I mean, athletes walking around with their athlete backpack, yeah. saying, I don't know, I came here to play soccer, not to play school. But yeah. I, I wouldn't say that's the, the wide majority of the student athletes. Yeah, um, I think my goal is just to talk to other student athletes and say, hey, like, this was badass. Like, yeah. try doing something new. Yeah. And I think once they try something new, there's, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then again, I, I think there are some student athletes who are blended into the school very nicely. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like that's very interesting about how, like, some student athletes choose to just stay. Yeah. Like, within their own bubble. Yeah. And, and for that, like, there's not really any hope. Like, you can't say, you can't, you can't put the blame on the university yeah. or on the normal students or whatever if a student athlete's not willing yeah. um, to do anything. But I, I think there are plenty of student athletes, and I would say the majority um, definitely are open to it. They just yeah. don't know where really to look. Yeah. And, and also, I, I think, I don't think we can just blame the student athletes. Maybe just, like, the normal students can, like, Maybe sometimes they're scared to like approach like, yeah. student athletes, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't think I'm intimidating. But. No. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I I think there's truth to both sides. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Um, but it's unfortunate because I, I would say many of my friend groups are not student athletes, and this time's mm -hmm. been tough because I've just been with yeah. my soccer team due to quarantine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So it's great to have this this tea chat with you guys and be able to talk with it's just, no, other sure. people. Sure experience exactly there. yeah exactly because I feel like one thing we can all you know appreciate and learn as students and also having conversations through tea is like just getting to know because I feel like there's like definitely a divide between students and student athletes mm -hmm. in terms and also within like non-student athletes like just regular students even within that there's a mini divide as well oh yeah so I feel like ultimately it's, it's having the conversation and going out of your comfort zone to have this conversation that will ultimately bring a greater good to everyone. Yeah, was that your kind of goal just within this this podcast? Um, that, that as well as just sharing the yeah. tea concept. Kind gotcha. Of and I feel like the tea concept, the main reason why it's so powerful is that obviously it's beyond a beverage, but because it's beyond a beverage, it's more of a social aspect. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just historically? Yeah. 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 Historically, yeah. 100%. Yeah, very cool. And, uh, you brought up quarantine, like with your soccer team, mm -hmm. like um, over the summer. When did you go back? Where did you quarantine? Yeah, so I was in um, California okay. for about half of it, and I was in Utah for the other half. Okay. And and how did you like stay fit and ready to? <sighs> it's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I mean, when I was in California, everything was in lockdown. Uh, my dad happened to have a. Um, immune system disease so I wasn't even allowed yeah. like by family rules to go yeah. on walks or go on yeah. runs yeah. Um, so th we thought it would be smart um, for his health for my health yeah. for me to go to Utah okay. yeah. and I spent the better half of my summer hiking in Moab um, wow. being outdoors and truly having a privileged blessed summer that 
not many people can say they've had. Um, it was so cool. Yeah, it was so yeah, cool. I've, I've been to Moab before. Oh, you have? So nice. Oh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's so nice. the best. Yeah. So instead of quarantining indoors, I, I quarantined outdoors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm so dope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, so sweater, but uh, yeah, I recognize how lucky I am to have that experience. So to answer your question, I, I didn't play much soccer, um, but I was hiking every day. So I was swimming. Kind of yeah. Mm. As much as I can. Yeah. You know, I'm a goalie, so I can <laughs> I can be a little less fit than I feel right sometimes. <laughs> Don't tell my coach that. <laughs> Um, kind of to, I guess, not get back to the soccer, but um, to talk more about, like, your coach and stuff. Yeah. Um, do you think that being here at Wake with such a competitive program brings its own, like, a, like special challenges in terms of being a student athlete? Just because our soccer program is so competitive. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's this... Um there's this image that you come to Wake to play soccer and then yeah. you go play pro. Yeah. yeah. And um, if people have that mindset, it's a very closed mindset, in my opinion. Absolutely. Where you're just focused on one thing, and we talked about student relations. Yeah. Um, hey, I don't think I'm going to join this club because I'm just going to be pro in a year. Yeah. Um, so I, I would discourage anyone coming to Wake playing soccer to have that mindset. Um, because, again... We produced a lot of pros, and that's great. But yeah. there's there's more to college, and there's more to wake than just Absolutely. kind of paving your way to yeah. professional yeah. soccer. And especially at a school like this, where the workload is rather rigorous, yeah. I feel like it's I feel like it's a danger to kind of commit yourself to that. Absolutely, and my coaches would agree with that, uh, given mm-hmm. our our GPAs. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. um, yeah, but so you mentioned. Um, co- We've mentioned like quarantine activities and mm-hmm. all that. So I'm curious as to during a quarantine and also spending a lot of time outdoors, how has that way, if that has contributed to, um, because I feel like being in nature allows you to connect so much deeper with who you are and yourself. So I'm curious as to like how that experience during quarantine has allowed you to connect it more with, I guess, understanding yourself better yeah no I, that's a great question and I'm um, inherently just a really emotional person uh-huh. really in touch with myself I feel like and being outdoors just gave me all the more chance to explore that yeah. um, I rethought my career path I <laughs> um, rethought who I want to be as a person I, yeah. I I mean quarantine the silver lining of it all was I was able to discover more about myself um and to your point, you can take so much from nature from the outside and apply it to the inside. And yeah. So it was, it was a great opportunity to be outdoors and explore the outdoors, but also kind of explore myself. Yeah. Do you have any like, specific examples on some of that experience? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, um, I was hiking through Bryce Canyon in, in southern Utah, and... Um, it was kind of my first week in Utah, and um, I'm getting to be a senior, mm-hmm. uh, and I was wondering what I wanted to do with my life in terms of career aspirations. Um, I'm a philosophy major, mm-hmm. awesome. um, but I was more being groomed by the business school uh, in terms of going into some sort of consulting. Right. And just being outdoors gave me a, a lot of time to kind of reflect and realize, you know, that's not really who I am as a person, that's not really the job that holds my social, political, and ideological values, and um, in that moment, I'm like, okay, what do I do now? I I don't want to go into consulting, Um, and I think the rest of the summer was just exploring, reading, um, finding out what I'm interested in that fits kind of my personal ideology, Mm -hmm. Um, and now I'm excited to to share that like I'll be pursuing a master's degree in international affairs with a emphasis on Latin American development and um, hopefully I'll, I'll be spending time wherever I end up in university in, in South America and Central America studying and researching what kind of what I'm passionate about that's awesome uh, very cool thank you yeah I'm excited <laughs> about it too <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could talk hours about it <laughs> for sure I mean I feel like uh, Bill has also had like that kind of experience with oh, yeah? tea instead. Yeah, with tea. Yeah. Like, it completely changed my path yeah. in terms of 
what I want to study because I've been thinking about because in Canada I'm it's also the same with in the um, in the UK is that when you apply for a university there mm-hmm. um, you have to pick your major right away out of senior year of high school yeah. so it's like very stressful in terms of like pretty much what you go into like what you decide to study you have to go through that path or so like it's not like it's way a lot forward. of pressure for yeah, a, it's a lot of pressure year old, huh? yeah um, but. I, I came in awake thinking I was gonna like double major in engineering and physics, mm-hmm. but then like it just didn't felt it didn't feel right after getting into it, because that didn't line with my my ideologies of what I feel like is like a good life and what I want to do with my life. Yeah. Um, but then so I had that question going for like a long time, and then T kind of came mm-hmm. into my life and it was just like. I felt I felt like there was a greater sense of purpose by pursuing, you know, not specific T, but like uh, I, I think it allowed me to, it allowed me to pave the way in terms of the like, mindfulness, the mindfulness, yeah. and yeah. also applying that same mindfulness and purpose to other areas. Yeah, cool. So right now, I'm probably can, I'm intending on pursuing a major in anthropology. Very cool. Yeah. Anthrosic, yeah. and it has to do kind of with what I'm going into. It's kind of like the cross divide between history and post-colonialism, anthro and, and culture and all, obviously political science yeah. and, and theory. And that's that's super badass, man. That's really commendable. What are you guys studying or planning on um, studying? So actually, I have a pretty similar story to Will as well. Um, I came in here as a biomedical engineering um, Damn, kind smart. of path, <laughs> pathway. Yeah. Um, I was ready to get that pre-med track, get that engineering degree, all of that stuff. And um, I also realized that I really just like I didn't enjoy it. I was doing it kind of because it's what I had been told to do as like a stereotypically smart kid coming out of high school. Yeah. They're like, oh, you got to go be an engineer. You got to go be a doctor. Why not both? Um, <laughs> and I decided kind of further on that um, I actually, I got into a, I'm in a program here that discusses like character and how to like, how to be a leader in today's world. And um, I took an FYS last year that I think Will also took with me or took a lot. in another class um, that taught Aristotelian virtue ethics. Oh, really? And kind of the concept of how, like, you can't flourish without the people around you flourishing. Um, there's mm-hmm. um, just, like, the ideas of how you should set your goals, the concept of, like, proximate ends and, like, legitimate ends. You're going to get me like talking that. about philosophy. You're going to get me <laughs> make me act up. <laughs> so now I'm, uh, now I'm actually a philosophy major. Oh, no kidding. probably a psychology double major. Awesome. I haven't decided yet. Who was your FYS yeah. class with? Uh, Dr. Lamb. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. He's a humanities professor, I believe. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in, in virtue ethics, um, Absolutely. Dr. Miller is huge with that yes. in the philosophy department. And then... Dr. Austin is the one who convinced me to become a philosophy major. She's um, a okay. really big ancient Greek awesome. philosopher. Oh, so, wow. um, names great. to look out for. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> very thank cool. You. How about um, you? Yeah, I'm an engineering major uh, with a minor in math. Like, I came in thinking I was going to be an engineering major. Yeah, and sometimes too. that's yeah, the way it goes. Sometimes yeah. it sometimes happens, you know. Like, yeah. But like my first two engineering courses, I really loved. So. I just decided to keep pursuing it. It's just it's what interests me. Yeah. This might be a little bit crude of a question, but where's the London accent? (laughs) (laughs) So I like kind of developed one the first two years I was there, but I moved to an international school. Mm. So like so I could take like AP courses and be in the American. Didn't take the A levels. No, I did not take the A levels. (laughs) I, I didn't take A-levels or GCSEs, so... Good for you. I kind of got a little bit lucky there, but... Um, but yeah, I don't think I Marcus take, Rashford can say the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, I, I moved to an international school, and they kind of just lost it, but... Yeah, I love London, though. It's one of my favorite places. Yeah. London and UK is, and Europe in general is huge on soccer, right? Yeah. The soccer culture... Or as to call it football there it's, it's like insane do you want to share some um, okay <laughs> yeah wait do you call it uh, soccer or football I call it I mean I use it interchangeably okay. um, usually I would say football footy okay uh, yeah. cool. but Cause, I'm not going to be offended if you okay because I was I was going to say football but I didn't know whether you do <laughs> whether react to it okay well um, 
Do you follow the Premier League at all? I do. I do. Awesome. What's your favorite team? Oof. Well, I, I'm actually a, a Swansea City supporter, oh, so we're wow. in the EFL Championship. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not the Premier League, but um, yeah, rough, rough times in Wales. <laughs> do you like uh, Wilfred Boney? Oh yeah, and the, I mean, he's gotten to be such a meme nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Come On We Do yeah, that that song is a classic. But um, I mean, he came from the era to visit, I think, in 2012, and yeah. just started banging in goals. <laughs> mm. um, Swan Zalona for a little while. Swan, you know your footy, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. meet you, fan. error. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's what um, attracted me to Swansea was mm. their their ideology, their style of play. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't go to Wales and say, hey, I'm Welsh, but my great-grandparents are from Wales. Absolutely. Um, I'm a mutt, but <laughs> it, it was more the style of play that kind of attracted me to the, yeah. to the team, and unfortunately, I'm still <laughs> supporting them. How about like, you? What, okay, well, I'm, I'm a Chelsea supporter. Oof, good for you. Yeah. Um, when I moved to London, we like lived almost right next to the Chelsea Stadium. Stanford, yeah. Yeah. So Very cool. I kind of just got in from there. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've been a Chelsea supporter yeah. since. Big Chelsea supporter. Five, five years old. So. Badass. Yeah. What was the question you were gonna ask? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh no. Um, oh yeah. How did you like become a like a soccer? Yeah. Oh, yes. How did you Ooh. get into soccer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I come from a, a tall family. My dad is uh, 6'10", <laughs> okay. and wow. I'm actually the shortest male in my family at 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, six, um, so you would think basketball, yeah. and that's when it started <laughs> off. I was four years old. I was playing basketball. I kept on falling on the ground, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whether you call it diving or being just extravagant... Um, <laughs> I kept falling on the ground, and I just loved the feeling of throwing myself on the ground, as weird as that sounds. <laughs> I remember I would come home from preschool, and I would just fall on the tile and just spread out and just lay around and flop around. And it got to the point where my parents would, um, when I got in trouble, they would say, instead of no TV, no video games, no sweets, it would be, you're not allowed to fall on the ground. <laughs> and I would cry about it. I would go to my room, I just want to cry, I just want to fall down. Um, and so after playing basketball for a couple of years, my dad looks at me with maybe a little bit of disappointment and says, son, maybe you should play soccer. It's, uh, it's a better, better, better game that's suited for you. And my mom's like, you know, you should be a goalkeeper. It's, I mean, it's falling on the ground. It's just with a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I see goalkeeping, I guess, is falling on the ground with a purpose. And I played basketball and soccer all the way up through high school um, and then just continued along that soccer route. Yeah, that's cool. That's great. So how did, uh, how did you get into, like, the San Jose Earthquakes and, yeah. like, that team? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Um, so they own me um, mm-hmm. right now. They have my rights. I was playing club soccer, which is the step below academy, yeah. mm-hmm. and a new coach came in and was scouting, um, and I was playing at a local tournament, uh, got invited for trials, um, talked to the technical director, all the higher-ups mm-hmm. in the club, and decided, hey, like if I want to take this more seriously, which I did, yeah. this is probably the next step. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I joined the academy. Um, I was in the academy for about three years. Uh, and loved every minute of it. Um, played with the first team a bit, um, training, and uh, at the time I was 16 years old. I was playing U16 football, and um, I got a call from the technical director, Chris Leach, and at the time our U18 goalkeeper was injured, and I, I would think he would be the first person to go to, yeah. um, but he was injured, so uh, that's how I got the call up to Argentina is... Hey man, you want to have like the time of your life? Yeah. Your life. I'm like, yeah. Absolutely. And so I, I went into it um, as much as I could with a professional attitude. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was tough pulling into the parking lot and seeing all these players yeah. walk out and <laughs> try not the fanboy and yeah. ask for pictures. But um, no, it truly was a, a really incredible experience. And yeah. it's one of those moments that you can truly say you peaked and not be disappointed about it. Because, I mean, where do you go from yeah, there? You'll like, you remember it. Forever. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. Forever. And that's, that's a huge event. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so going off of that, who is who do you think is better, Messi or Ronaldo? Oof. Do you have any biases? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, 
beyond the fact that I played with Messi, I, I just think he's a more complete footballer. Yeah. And I agree. Just his. Uh, I, I'm sure. sorry for that disappointment, Will. <laughs> but, um, I don't know my my ideas and tactical analysis mm-hmm. and ideologies just fit the way he plays. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm a big fanboy of Pep Guardiola, yeah, absolutely. Marcelo Bielsa, mm. um, awesome. fluid football and, yeah. and just total football and Messi I think is just the the key component of that. Sure. So I got two more Messi's and one Ronaldo. Yes, sir. Well, you can just leave we the were, table right now. We were talking before, about yeah, this before. before. before the podcast, were you placing we some bets or what? Yeah. <laughs> we were placing some bets on whether we'd not we'd have a two on two. I should have known once I heard that you were, yeah. you were training with Argentina. <laughs> should have been two. Oh. No, obviously, like incredible respect for both players. Yeah. No, uh, and they're, I mean, they're different, so it's tough to compare them. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't know, man. Messi's out of the contract, maybe. Wake will swoop in. <laughs> <laughs> Get him on a... I wonder if he's graduated college or not. <laughs> you know... Get him in on a, we can get him in on a master's we, We'll degree. have to check with compliance. Um, <laughs> call NCAA, see if it's allowed. But yes. who knows? Maybe he wants a degree. Yeah, I think that's what we should use the billion-dollar endowment. <laughs> How to use it for something. His wage budget. Maybe that's not the business school. But. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So being around... Having trained around like professional soccer athletes what like did it feel like was there like a, some type of vibe around them like just essence that, that felt different yeah and, and as much as you want to say that like it, it's the most fun you'll ever have in your life and it's the beautiful game there is a certain sense of this is your job mm-hmm. yeah. um, I mean if I misplaced a pass in my academy days I might not play the next game but if someone misses a pass in their professional they have to worry about their family. Um, and right. so there was that sense of seriousness. Wow. Um, and I think that has carried a li- little bit over to college. Um, obviously, it's more serious. Um, but you're with your brothers. And I, I think that's the one thing that separates college from professionals. Mm-hmm. Um, you have so many Wake alum who come back and say, hey, I, I'm happy I graduated. I'm happy I'm making money professionally. But, man, do I miss that brotherhood. Yeah. Because um, right. you, you go into these teams and people have their own families. Yeah. And this is their job. Um, so it's not as much of a camaraderie, I would say, as mm-hmm. youth football or college football. Oh, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Like, yeah. But it kind of makes sense, though, because you kind of move around a bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, contracts aren't guaranteed. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say it's it's cutthroat, and that's yeah, not to say that there's yeah. no friends on the team. Yeah. Um, but it is your job, uh, and I think people view view it as such. Right. Um, one thing that I was kind of wondering about is just like the intensity of training with a national team. Yeah. I mm-hmm. feel like, I mean, especially the way it's at least portrayed on TV is like the national team performances mean everything to a player. Yeah. Um, did you feel that intensity, I guess, while you were training with them? Yeah, I mean, representing your, your national team yeah. is the pinnacle of kind of yeah. what you aim to do, to be able to stand up for whatever national anthem yeah. um, and put your heart over your chest and sing as loudly as you can. I mean, you see in the World Cup, some people have tears in their eyes yeah, as yeah. the camera pans. Um, certainly. And that can lead to one of two things. It can lead to passion. Mm-hmm. Um and I would say passion leveling on anger. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, I mean, people are so passionate yeah. about their sport, they're yeah. passionate about their country, and that definitely came out um, in both good and bad ways. I think it brought a whole new level of accountability, mm-hmm. um, seriousness, um, but also I, I think you can see <laughs> players taking it in mm-hmm. and saying, mm-hmm. hey, like, I might not have the chance to represent my country again. Yeah. And so I, I think there's also a level of appreciation. Um, and I like to focus on that even yeah, more. That's really yeah, that's awesome. So going off that, what do, you, what do you think is more important to a player, the World Cup or the Champions League? Yeah. That's a really good question. I, I mean, I think um, lots of different players will have lots of different opinions. Yeah. Um, club has taken over in recent years, but... I don't know. I think <laughs> I don't have what an answer for you. you personally? For me personally, um, given that I probably will never be in either situation, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I probably dream about lifting a World Cup more yeah. than I dream about yeah. lifting Champions League. Absolutely. There's that like because national it pride. Yeah, and it only comes around. Yeah. Every four years. Yeah, every four years. So. And this is coming from a leftist who doesn't have the most patriotism. So. Understand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so going back to, uh, I'm very curious about your experience with T and the intersection between soccer and mm-hmm. T and how you got into it. So was it mainly from training with the Argentinian soccer players and getting to Yerba Mate that allowed you to tap into T, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think um, I started drinking from Bombillas, I started drinking Yerba Mate, but there was certainly that social aspect missing because yeah. no one else was doing it. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned before the, the whole mindfulness aspect of it. It's so important and so cool. Um, and that's something I, I've gained a lot from. Um, but I mean, just as tea is a part of cultures around the world, so is soccer. And right. often they, they mix. And that was just, I think, an example of that. I was going to say, um, one of my kind of also, like, entry factors to tea was uh, I follow Miguel Almiron uh-huh. on Instagram. Miggy. Yeah, I'm a Newcastle fan. Oh, wow. He <laughs> he runs a lot of Yerba Mate posts, and it's really interesting to see. But, um, I, remember, I remember two or three years ago, like, Yerba Mate started getting big and people were posting pictures of professional footballers with yerba mate mm. yeah. like is this a drug like <laughs> uh, what is this it, does it make them so good yeah. um, but uh, that brought the limelight I think on yerba mate tea in, in general yeah uh, but it, they've always done it it's just it, more and more pictures are coming out of it yeah, yeah. absolutely it's because uh, for them it's part of their culture like yeah. in South America yerba mate is huge and because I know even within your remote, there's just different types. You have like the yep. hot one, the cold ones, and usually they all share the same straw, no matter how many people there are. Yeah. And that's that's I think that's a pretty social aspect. Oh, I think that's so cool. Yeah. Not now. Not but now. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other time, like sitting in a circle, everyone taking a swig of uh, of yerba mate. Man, that's the dream. And yeah. I hope I can get the chance to do that with people in South America one day. Yeah. It, awesome. It's interesting. You brought up, like, there's different types of yerba mate. I think it comes from this tree, um, like the holly tree. Yeah. Um. And there's a couple other teas that come from it. But um, I'm also really interested in the way it kind of presents itself today. Because um, for the longest of time, Spanish conquerors <laughs> enslaved um, the native people of Argentina, Paraguay, mm-hmm. um, the Guarani. And... Um, this was a huge, huge um, human rights abuse and kind of like slave controlled thing that existed for years. But now it's something that's embraced by the local people. Yeah. And I think that's super cool that they've kind of turned it on their heads and it's the Argentinian national drink. And it, I mean, it's ingrained in their culture for good and bad reasons. But um, just looking at the history is really fascinating to me. That is very fascinating. One of my friends from from my high school was Argentinian, uh-huh. and he had a, a mate. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it's called, but like the bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, every, like almost every day, we'd have like we just pass it around yeah. like this, and it was just it was awesome. Like I just talk. So it's cool. Definitely like that aspect of just social. That's really cool that you were able to, to kind of go to a school that has so many different people. Yeah, yeah but like, I, that's one of the things I loved about going to an international school, mm-hmm. is just meeting people from all over the world. Yeah, that, I mean, that's super fascinating. I, I totally relate to that, I, coming from the Bay Area, yeah. all sorts of people. Um, when I first started playing soccer, competitive soccer, I was the only white kid on my team. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm kind of was forced to learn Spanish Um, and just to see how big of a part of my life it's kind of played is fascinating knowing that I'm probably going to go into a master's program just because I joined a Hispanic soccer team when I was seven years old is crazy really something you can track back all the way through your youth yeah yeah and it is kind of crazy that like some decisions that you make when you're five years old Mm -hmm. really do affect shape you yeah I feel like who you are as a kid growing up definitely plays a big role into who you are like today. Yeah. 
and it, it just plays out through your lifetime. Like, especially in terms of, like, your character and, like, the exposure and experiences that you've been exposed to as a kid has a huge impact. Big nurturist, huh? Yeah. You a psych major or a psych minor? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I agree, though. I agree. Um, you are your surroundings. All right. For sure. Do you think that there will be a potential in the future where tea culture, you know, has a kind of perception that's, like, coffee, where it's, like, pretty, pretty ingrained in the Western culture? Yeah, I mean, I just from my knowledge, it, it's been rising. Like tea yeah. has been rising in in the United States. Um, I think there's this sense of genuineness mm-hmm. that perhaps is missing in the greater American society that is Absolutely. involved with tea and sharing of tea. But I hope we can get to that point where we're all doing this on a regular basis. Yeah. How about you? What do you think? I think. I think there definitely is opportunity because I and potential because you know I believe that nothing is impossible and you know cultures and businesses like all of these things are created by, by by humans yeah so there's definitely potential there but I think the the main thing the main barrier is that if I'm comparing it with coffee or even alcohol I guess it's it has I feel like it has more um similarities to alcohol because it's more social i i would agree with that yeah because coffee is more instant you get it instantly and mm-hmm. it's like something you want to drink alone you want to have your morning cup of coffee and just or get it on the go, go fast yeah, yeah. Fast. but tea is like you have to be it has to be enjoyed it has to be enjoyed with people um so i think there's definitely potential in bringing new light there and i i i think i mean this is super Generalizing, but American society at a whole sometimes doesn't have the capacity to be able to put their phones down and enjoy mm. a conversation and do something like this, even without a podcast mic. Yeah. Um, so that I think that is a barrier too. Is yeah. Our attention span is so short. Um, grab a coffee and go. Yeah. 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 That's. True. I mean, even this whole podcast concept came from having the initial like multiple experiences with tea and mm-hmm. like realizing that wow like two hours just flew by and we were just everyone just in the conversation was so present yeah yeah and I'm like being present is yeah, yeah. just so huge yeah, I agree yeah. some of the first few nights that we had here at school we um we just like spent in his room drinking tea and it was kind of absolutely unreal we would be sitting there talking and it'd be three in the morning yeah and yeah. we just <laughs> kind of all like look at each other and like be like okay I guess it's time to go to bed yeah <laughs> that's cool and we've just been talking for the whole night and it's it's really awesome it kind of forces you to get in and focus on everybody yes I agree yeah. mm-hmm. talk to me about this club man it seems like it's on the move oh yeah the World Tea Association yes, yes. <laughs> it's I'm very excited we uh we actually had our first meeting back in April like okay. last semester that's well like technically this is our first semester on campus mm-hmm. and with COVID it, it's very hard because um, it's hard to like book in person stuff but right now we're still unchartered so we're technically not a uh, official club yet however we can still uh, host events I got that zoom link yeah <laughs> the 14th right yeah, oh, next, yeah next Monday will be our first virtual event um, we're going to introduce everyone to the club so, so this semester we are still going to have tea sessions like this mm-hmm. and it will be outside probably like five, six people at max because um, that's just like the general n- nature of having tea. Like, mm-hmm. You want to have a small intimate session. Or, so everyone can be included. Yeah, yeah everyone can be included in yeah. conversation. Because if it's like way too many people, then... It goes, people have their own little yeah. conversation and not everyone's present. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's like, there's not really that much barriers in terms of not being chartered other than receiving funding because if you have funding, we can have like more of these sessions, get more gear. Get but more all, tea. Yeah, get more yeah, tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sir. Um, so, but other than the tea session that we're still going to have is we're going to have expert tea panels where um, there's going to be professors at Wake who will actually have research on, for example, Japanese tea culture, mm. tea history, and other people from outside of Wake Forest community who are really into tea. And it will be like a panelist of sorts and everyone just tuning in and have questions. That's dope. Yeah. So that's one thing. And also like tea education series, you know. It will be all, these will be virtual 
unless we can later on have in person meetings. Mm -hmm. But that's the plan. Well, invite me to all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, the goal is just to create a community around tea. Yeah. And to and to like introduce and spread the awareness that tea exists beyond a the beverage. chai latte and yeah. Starbucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's no offense against chai. Chai is amazing, but yeah. it's just not really what you want. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah. You guys got anything fun for the weekend coming up? Um, I mean, since we're kind of quarantined, not a lot. There is a game day going on tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to go to the game day. Very like cool. the drive-in. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I feel like we didn't get a lot, like, we didn't get into, like, your daily routine as a student athlete at Wake. Yeah. So, do you, like, go into, like, what what it's like to be at school and also to practice and, like, what you do on a daily basis? Kind yeah. Of? I, can, I mean, I can just describe my yeah. my day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. um, we're preparing for a game on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, so, the last few days before that are just preparation. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, double days are over. <laughs> there's this period of time where school starts and we still have double days wow. and it's just it's double days just like you pra practice twice a day. yeah you practice twice a day and lift probably oh. um, some wow. triple days <laughs> triple days <laughs> but um, it's 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 a tough time um today I got up around 6.30 uh, we had a morning training um cold shower <laughs> not to be a basic YouTuber um, <laughs> describing their daily routine, but yeah. woke myself up, um, came over to Spry Stadium, uh, rolled out, got my ankle taped. Uh, we had a, like a two-hour session, got done around 9.45. Um, I had the time to go back to Deacon Place, which is where I live, oh. make myself breakfast. Um, I snuck in a nap. I love naps. Oh, yes. um, and then... Kind of my attention focused more on class. I only had two classes today, which is great. I'm taking um, intermediate guitar theory, and wow. then um, I had astronomy. Okay, awesome. And then just meetings. Um, so I had a meeting with a professor who I want to do research with, and then transition back to soccer. <laughs> had a team meeting, um, which is what I was doing just right now. Yeah. And now I'm here and. The night is free, um, so I'll probably go back, listen to some music, maybe do a little homework. Today wasn't too stressful, thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. A lot of practices, a lot of meetings. Yeah. What's your, what's your take on, um, you know, having like a discipline and routine lifestyle? Yeah. It's very philosophical of you. <laughs> um, I have a few different takes. I think... Um, some aspects of the day to be disciplined, for example, taking a shower every day in the morning yeah. is great. Um, and routine can be great. It can be great for your mental health to have something structural. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, doing like the same thing from nine to five every day doesn't seem too attractive to me. Yeah. We talk about being present. Um, we talked about it previously in our conversation I just don't think I could be present if every day was the same yeah yeah and to have different conversations different experiences that allows me to be more creative and to be more present um, so I don't know if that was a good answer or not but uh, I have I, I think structure is good but change is also good yeah it's it's one of those things where you gotta balance it yeah balance and everything yeah yeah it's cool awesome well we are tuning to have those really good conversations. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while. You want to go again tomorrow or what? Yeah. yeah. yeah let's go for it. Let's go part two. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me. This was good. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank yeah. You. Tune it out. Tune it out. <laughs> Tune it out. <laughs> Do it together. Peace. Peace. Dominic Peters out. Dude, that was so fun.